uh, that corresponds to how much electricity you make. So if you make a megawatt hour of electricity, you can lop off your tax bill $18, $19, $20. Well, that's cool. Um, what's the problem with it? The problem with it is that Congress doesn't like to pass long-term tax credits because they don't like to uh, tie the hands of future Congresses and they don't like the long-term revenue impact. So they say, okay, we'll pass it for a year, for two years, and then if we still think it's a good idea, we'll renew it. Well, that's great, but then you get companies like Vestas that say, now do I really want to plant a billion dollars worth of factories in a country where the support for my industry might go away in a year? Eh, not so much, right? So what you see in that pattern, that up and down, is a pattern where the tax credit gets passed for a year or two years. It gets right up to the edge of expiration and everybody says, yeah, you know, we like wind power, but we just haven't been able to get the law through Congress and everybody's rushing really hard to get their wind turbines installed on December 19th. And they make the deadline and the wind turbine the, the wind credit expires, and Congress comes back after uh, the January recess, the holiday recess, and they renew the tax credit. Everybody starts again, and they start racing. But because they weren't sure if it was going to be renewed, there's going to be no action that year, right? It's only going to be next year. So that's why you have this up and down, start and stop cycle, and that has been what has made our industry pretty challenging. Uh, from, a, from a financial point of view. You probably want to know where the wind turbines are. Uh, this is a map, and I think for those of you that aren't uh, colorblind like I am, uh, you'll be able to see, you know, there's a, a lot of wind turbines here, not so much here. Now the wind in North America is pretty much this belt from Texas on up through Alberta, and Texas is actually uh, where most of the wind turbines are. And it's a combination of some real aggressive policies that were actually uh, put into place when uh, George Bush Jr. was president. A combination of that and really good wind and a deregulated open electricity system that let people build projects and sell on the open market. And that's kind of where the center of growth has been. Other center is probably up here. Um, Minnesota and Iowa and Illinois have a lot of wind uh, and also some fairly decent policies. California is really where our industry started, but for those of you that have done business in California, it's just wretched. It's just terrible. I mean, you can't really build anything easily in California, whether it's a wind plant or a coal plant or, or starting a small business. And it's very difficult to get transmission built in California for a mixture of legitimate environmental concerns and just difficulty of doing business. But what California has done is they've passed a law saying that the state is going to get 33% of its power from renewable energy. And so I think California is a place where as difficult as it is, you're going to see a lot more activity coming. So where are the factories, for those of you that are interested in the manufacturing side? <laughs> You know, there's obviously a lot of people that used to make widgets for automobiles that would love to be making widgets for wind turbines. If you go to our national trade show, next one is in this month uh, in Anaheim, but if you go to our annual trade show last couple of years, there's a hundred guys walking around that make bolts trying to connect with wind turbine manufacturers. Uh, if we could make wind turbines out of bolts, you know, we'd be set. The challenge is that the quality quantity balance uh, is different in our industry. And you talk to people and you say, well, we need a ring gear that looks kind of like this. And they say, well, OK, I can make one of those in my machine shop. And you say, OK, can you make it 12 feet across? And they say, oh, that's an issue. And I say, you know, can you make it to this Six Sigma quality spec if you're only going to have a run of 200 a year? I say, no, I'm used to making, you know, 50,000 a year, right? So there is manufacturing capacity that we can retool in this country from some, you know, traditional Rust Belt industries into, you know, newer manufacturing. But again, it's, it's taking people time to make that transition to lower quantities 
higher quality, larger scale. You know, bolts are great, but our bolts are six feet long. Uh, where are the jobs? So at this point, uh, we estimate that directly and indirectly, uh, <coughs> the wind industry was supporting about 75,000 jobs in the U.S. in 2010. And that's a drop since 2009, and that's primarily on the construction side. There was less construction in 2010, uh, primarily because of the effects of you know, the economic crisis, the financial crisis, which, which slowed business down. Um, but again, you've still got kind of the service side and some of the manufacturing is, is still holding steady. So here, you know, you've got the yellow is, you know, one to a hundred jobs. This dark, I'm going to guess blue, uh, is, you know, over 8,000 jobs. A lot of jobs in Texas maintaining that, uh, that, that wind fleet. So how does wind fit into the future? Here's a forecast of the energy mix. I've just got two more slides, I think. Um, from 1960 out to 2030, right? So past here, it's kind of forecast. And what you're seeing in North America is no growth in nuclear, which I think is true. You're seeing sort of a ramp down with coal because coal is really in the crosshairs for regulatory reasons today. I don't think anyone is building new coal plants. And a lot more natural gas and a bit more wind. So what's happening with natural gas? Well. This is something that I think a lot of people in our industry aren't tracking. It's important, so I'm going I'm to spend a minute on it. Something has really changed in the North American energy sector. And if you're reading the papers, you're probably seeing people talking about shale gas. Shale gas, what this means is pulling natural gas out of the ground from the kind of geology that we've never really been able to reach before. And what has happened is really technological change. Two things. We've learned how to drill horizontally. So you've got this hard, non-porous, shale-like geology, and it contains a lot of gas. And now, instead of having to drill 100 different holes to get to it, we figured out how to drill one hole and then go sideways for like a couple of miles. And that has really changed things. Second thing that we've really learned how to perfect is called hydraulic fracturing, fracking. And that means once you drill that hole, you pump down a mixture of water and chemicals and sand, and you blow apart that hard, non-porous rock. And the sand goes into the fractures to hold them open, and you suck the gas out. And what it means is that we suddenly have access in North America to a huge quantity of natural gas, more than we thought we would have at a very competitive price. And what I'm showing you here is just the shale gas resource, what is expected in growth from that resource, just shale gas. And it's really changed the outlook for the power industry. And most of, the, most of the anticipated additions in the next couple of years are shale gas. And it's going to be replacing coal. And if you're an environmentalist, that's a good thing because burning gas is a lot cleaner than burning coal. If you're in the wind business or the solar business, it's really threatening because that gas is fairly cheap right now. And of course, it's not cleaner than solar and it's not cleaner than wind. Uh, but it is the new reality. And I think a lot of us are figuring, you know, we're looking at energy prices, uh, you know, general electricity prices, and we're thinking, well, they're just low because there's been a recession. And once economic activity picks up, then demand for power will pick up, and everybody will be fine again. And I guess the message I would leave you with is that's, that's really not the right story. Yeah, it's true, but there's something deeper going on, and this is what it is that the energy landscape is, is, is really changing. So we're going to compete, and we're going to do pretty well. And your guys are going to compete, and you're going to do pretty well. But we're going to have to compete. It's going to be tough. It's going to be a tough industry. So if there's anybody interested you know, in a career in wind, because it seems easy, uh, it's not, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be a tough, competitive industry. Uh, why, why are we positive? Because we think our cost structure uh, looks pretty good. And that if you're talking about building a new plant, the cost of making electricity from wind is competitive with making electricity from a new gas plant. We're pretty sure about that. And that's why we're pretty optimistic about our prospects.